the homeless population mushroomed, shelters were overrun, and entire communities devolved into squalor when city services evaporated. This was the environment into which Eberhard delivered the State of the Union address. Hawk, Kellogg, and Glory were already in place when Everhart strode into the recently replanted Rose Garden. The press and the nation anxiously awaited Everhart's vision for the way out of the economic collapse. Flashing his celebrated smile, he stepped smartly to the podium, opening his remarks with a customary greeting. Good evening, my fellow Americans. It would be the only traditional thing he'd say all day. I know you're wondering how we're going to get out of this mess, so I'll get straight to it. He suddenly stretched his arms toward the camera as if he were embracing the entire nation. My fellow citizens, I say to you today, in the presence of Almighty God and all mortal men, let this hour mark the beginning of a new era, a new beginning, a new direction in the foreign and domestic policy of the United States of America. As God is my witness, if you'll listen to your president, do what I say and trust me. I promise not only to lead you out of this desert of despair, but I will lead you into an oasis of a future that few men have had the courage to envision. This will be an historic era, the era that claims the right, no, the duty, to govern this great nation by the wisdom and authority of God Almighty. The audacity of the statement stunned the press who sat in silent disbelief. Since the foundation of this grand democratic experiment, we've abided by the doctrine of separation of church and state. It was a good idea. But today, when I consider the state of the union, the ways of the world, and the hearts of men, I'm led to the inescapable conclusion that the only way out of this mess is to bring the hallowed name of Jesus into the hallowed halls of government. A rustling tide of clicking shutters clattered through a press corps of confusion as Everhart changed years again. You've heard it said that history repeats itself. Well, it does. At this very moment, we are experiencing the repetition of the exact same circumstances that challenged the prophet Elijah during the time of Jezebel's priests. Like the faithful of old, we today find ourselves in the midst of a holy war. Nobody wants to call it that, but that's what it is. And the same question that confronted Elijah way back then is challenging us here today. The question was and is, whose God is God? Let me ask that again. I said, whose God is God? An expression of moral superiority nestled stoically on his face as he stepped from behind the podium and paced to and fro. Jezebel's priests say that Baal is God. I, like Elijah before me, say that it's Yahweh, Jehovah, Elohim, who is God Almighty. You may not realize it, but the new Jezebel's priests are these present-day Muslims straight out of the bowels of Babylon. And the new Baal is none other than Allah. Now I want you to remember how God sent forth fire that burned not only Baal's altar, but also everything around it. Everything. Well, that's what Jehovah Yahweh God is going to do again in these times. These people who want to destroy our way of life, these Muslims who hate us because of our freedom, I'm telling you today that God is going to utterly destroy them destroy them to a point where there's nothing left but ashes, and he's going to use us to do it. The time of kowtowing to these blasphemers is over. It's finally time to let the Islamic world know again, once and forever, whose God is God. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Turn to me, and I will heal the land. And I give you fair warning. I come as a thief in the night. Blessed is he who keeps watch. And just like that, he was gone.